talk, and then we'll have uh, Nico Kriegeskorte and Alona Fish, and then we'll have a panel with um, the speakers from this session in addition to the speakers from the previous session, and then we can open up for more general discussion. Um, Great, I think without further ado, I'll just get uh, started. And um, my name is Greta, and I'm a PhD student at MIT working in the intersection of neuroscience of language and artificial neural network models. And um, today, uh, within this uh, grand scheme of our GAC of how do we optimally use neuroscience data to guide the next generation of brain models, uh, I would like to focus on, um, if I can switch my slides, Great, optimizing data collection uh, for model development within language. And uh, I am this orange dot here. As you can see, I'm pretty far on the one end of, um, of the axis here on exp uh, in particular experimental design. And uh, the last section of my talk, I'll be arguing for the uh, value of using um, artificial neural network models to uh, create stimulus sets for language neuroscience experiments. Great. And um, why do we care? Why is this a really exciting time to be developing and improving uh, models of language? Uh, first of all, within the last couple of years, we've seen a revolution in language models. And I don't think I need to convince anyone here or anyone who just tangentially tracks uh, popular media that these language models are now immensely powerful. And also, we've seen that these language models are also very predictive of brain activity of humans that process language, as has been shown by several studies within just the very last few years. So basically, until very recently, uh, we did not have these models. Uh, what we had were these like very loose descriptive uh, ideas of that certain brain regions might support, might support certain aspects of language processing. Now, given that we have these language models uh, that produce very human-like output, we can now go from these more word-level descriptions to these predictive mechanistic models of language. However, to build these quantitatively accurate models of language processing, uh, we need data that is suitable uh, for developing these models. So in the spirit of this GAC, I want to focus on why current data might suffer from limitations and how we can improve data collection and use within language. So the question that I want to focus on today is why are most existing data sets within language not ideal for model development? Basically, what are the bottlenecks? Specifically, I want to cover these three points. The first one is on group averaging and potential pitfalls of uh, averaging across individual brains. The second one is on experimental design structure of many language data collection efforts. And the third one is on the stimuli the sentences themselves. And I'll focus on these three bottlenecks, and I also want to provide some concrete steps that we can or already are taking uh, to collect data that would ultimately allow us to build these accurate artificial models of language processing. So let's get started with the first point, which is on group averaging. And group averaging refers to a traditional approach where brains are being averaged in a common space, meaning that individual activation maps are projected to a common brain space and averaged. And as we see in this figure, um, this is across uh, 15 participants. And then you would average, and then you would evaluate uh, these brain maps. However, interpreting these average maps is pretty tricky. Um, the main problem here is that this common space averaging ignores well-established um, inter-individual variability in individual brains and the locations of functional areas, including uh, language regions. And as a result, this approach might suffer from some limitations, um, specifically two limitations. One is that areas that are robustly present at the individual level, here shown as the blue dots, might not be detectable at the group level. Another uh, limitation is that nearby distinct areas, here shown as the green and the blue dots, make it blurred together when they get averaged. To address these challenges, uh, around a decade ago, uh, Efedorenko, my advisor, uh, developed uh, an approach where language responsive areas are being defined functionally in individual brains without being constrained to fall within the exact same anatomical locations across individuals. 
What is important here is that you'd be averaging across the signals from the brains in these functionally localized areas as opposed to averaging the brains themselves. And the localizer that we use to define the language responsive areas is a functional localizer where we are contrasting brain areas, uh, con sorry, contrasting um, participants reading um, sentences to some kind of stimulus that is perceptually similar but lacks the meaning and structure of language. A specific example of that would be that of sentences and a list of non-words as shown here. Um, and the contrast between these sentences and lists of non-words is aimed at identifying regions that are sensitive to word and sentence level meaning. And this is what we denote as the high level language network. And other work has validated that this uh, language network is a functionally integrated system um, that responds to both language comprehension and production, is independent of input modality, um, responds to auditory, visual, and even sign language, and can be identified using task-free resting state paradigms. So if we do this for every single participant, it yields something like this. Here we are looking at the left hemisphere of a surface inflated brain, and as you can see, the exact um, locations uh, of these language responsive areas, as defined by the sentences and non words contrast, do not fall in the exact same anatomical locations. And I want to note here that this language localization approach is not specific to fMRI. Uh, one can perform this localization based on both intracranial or EG or MEG recordings. So in that way, by functionally defining the language network, uh, we basically obtain a clear target for studies that are aimed at investigating the nature of these representations and computations. It allows us to separate the language system from nearby systems that support different cognitive processes, such as general attention or social inference. Moreover, if we want to evaluate and develop models of language, we know which human target we are comparing to, instead of an average and potentially conflated mix of functional systems. A last note to this point is that of course, there's been many data collection efforts in the past where maybe functional localization was not possible or this was simply not uh, performed. And if we still want to make use of these data sets, these past existing data sets without functional localizers, we have developed a language atlas based on more than 800 individuals. And this is a probabilistic atlas that for each single location in the brain provides the probability of that particular location being a part of the language network. In that way, we can make sense of past data sets by selecting voxels that are most likely to respond to language. Now I want to move on, move on to the second point, which is on experimental design. And this particular session, uh, se section is focused on fMRI, which is the most uh, accessible and used modality for language neuroscience. So block designs refer to um, a type of design where a small number of conditions that being sentence types, uh, are examined in blocked uh, designs where a condition is presented continuously for an interval of time. Um, well, now I have my mouse. Um, the sentences that make up each condition, uh, for example, the sentences shown in orange and blue here, uh, are defined by us, the experimenter. Uh, importantly, because these are being analyzed as blocks uh, due to the continuous presentation, each single sentence cannot be modeled separately, and we can't investigate these fine-grained differences in sentences. Uh, on the other hand, we also have a type of design called event-related design. Um, here, each single trial uh, is its own discrete point in time, but most previous studies within language neuroscience have still modeled uh, these as condition-level estimates, so you'd still be interested in the sentences in the orange or blue condition, and uh, many designs besides very uh, naturalistic narrative type of designs have not tried to model each single sentence as its own stimulus. And this is probably partly because of the hypotheses associated with the conditions of interest uh, that have been driving these experiments. Another uh, reason is probably because the analyses of these like pretty rapid uh, points in time in fMRI is pretty challenging and is more complex and depends on pretty accurate modeling of the underlying hemodynamic response function. Um, so that has definitely been like a technical challenge. Uh, fortunately, there's uh, a lot of interest in actually modeling these uh, brief event-related designs, and a package has been released uh, just a few months ago uh, called GLM Single, 
um, can definitely recommend the, the preprint and the package. Um, and the goal of GLM Single is uh, to basically provide a package to um, model these very short, um, uh, quick event-related fMRI designs. And I know that the natural scenes data sets has already been mentioned in the previous section a couple of times. And actually, GLM Single was uh, used to model um, all the data in the natural scenes data sets, which provides um, estimates of thousands of unique images. So the core premise of GLM Single is that noise structure differs between participants, uh, between brain regions, and between voxels. And this framework takes uh, three steps to combat noise in a data-driven way. The first one is that it um, allows to identify custom hemodynamic response function, HRF, um, from a library of candidate functions uh, that were derived from actual fMRI data. And this allows to identify a best fitting uh, HRF for each single voxel, instead of just a default HRF um, for all voxels. Uh, the second optimization is that it allows to select an optimal number of noise regressors, and this is done by first identifying voxels that are unrelated to the experimental paradigm, performing PCA on the time series of these voxels, and then uh, doing a cross-validation on out-of-sample uh, predictivity uh, on how many noise regressors to uh, exclude. And the third and last optimization is that GLM single allows to use uh, rich regression to model voxel responses as opposed to just the normary ordinary least squares regression. And um, because these event-related uh, super rapid uh, designs um, have trials that occur very closely spaced in time, the ordinary, ordinary least squares solution might suffer from instability and overfitting and regularization can help dampen the noise inflation caused by these correlated predictors. Um, so this is uh, really some great steps that we can take to improve the modeling of these quick event-related, very condition-rich designs, uh, for instance, like the NSD data set. Uh, but there's one thing that makes this somewhat uh, complicated for language. And um, because of cross-validation for the last two uh, optimizations, number of noise regressors and the rich regularization in the voxel responses, um, even though GLM single would provide an estimate for each single trial, it depends uh, on and requires the existence of repeated trials. That is, you'd have a trial that is being rep repeated across your experiment, and then the underlying assumption here is that you expect those responses to be approximately the same. And in vision, this is a pretty uh, common uh, way to design your experiment. You know, you'd repeat the same stimulus, the same image within an experiment, and then use that as a metric for obtaining reliable responses. However, um, the visual system, which will yield pretty similar and highly correlated responses across multiple repetitions, the language system does not have this property. If you've heard a sentence and understood it, you won't engage in the same computations the second time you hear an experiment, in particular over a pretty short fMRI experiment. So we can't really do this in language neuroscience. So if we don't want to repeat stimuli, and we still want to make use of these very cool data-driven uh, approaches to model our data, uh, then what do we do? Uh, we want to be able to select the optimal number of noise regressors and we also want to regularize our responses, but we don't know in which way because we can't rely on the out-of-sample prediction where the underlying assumption is that the same trial should yield the same brain responses. And this question might seem very specific to this pipeline, but I think it's a more general issue that if you do not want to assume that a repeated stimulus should yield an exact same brain response, how do you evaluate the quality and robustness of your data set? Um, so the goal is to obtain as good as a robust data set as possible. So if you have your parameters, um, hyperparameters that you want to determine, you can either just blindly set them, you can fix them, say I want to always remove five noise regressors and always regularize at like 0.5, but that kind of defeats the purpose uh, of, you know, participants' brain regions experiments have different noise structures and you're not uh, really making use of, uh, of these uh, pipelines. So. Another approach is a little more brute force, is that you have your hyperparameters and you simply like try pretty much all of them, um, which is what I did. 
Um, so in this experiment, uh, I had participants read 1,000 sentences, 1,000 diverse sentences in this like event-related design that I just mentioned. Each single sentence just presented once. And in this big matrix, uh, we're looking at the correlation of responses of the fMRI responses of the left hemisphere language network for one participant by using different instantiations of modeling parameters. That means that every single row and column in this symmetric matrix uh, is a different uh, instantiation of these hyperparameters. So for instance, I think this data has been modeled uh, using removing, uh, removing five uh, noise regressors, using five noise regressors, and um, by using a particular regularization fraction, and so on. And as we can see from this matrix, this is a Pearson correlation. Fortunately, all these modeling uh, choices yield somewhat correlated responses, which is good, because when we model our data, we hope to get to some kind of ground truth. Um, but we still have a choice. We still need to decide what is the optimal instantiation of modeling parameters, which data set do we want to move on with. And uh, thanks to Kendra Kay for helping me to think uh, through some of this. Um, so yeah, here we have 128 um, models in total, and which instantiation do we want to use? Uh, so we need some kind of evaluation metric, and one way to, um, to, to evaluate this would be to say that for each single instantiation of these modeling parameters, you can basically check how well can you fit an encoding model using your favorite language model of interest. And you can see, oh, for this particular set of parameters, I have very high predictivity, very good encoding performance. That's one way of doing it. However, uh, you might bump into circularity issues because you're also trying to evaluate your model downstream. So that's kind of a tough, tough one. Um, another more conservative approach that I've been using is, uh, is inter-participant correlation. The assumption here is that we can expect some level of participant to participant consistency while admitting that obviously not all humans are identical. Hence, any method or any modeling parameters that will improve participant to participant consistency will likely be a pretty sound denoising and modeling choice. So that's what I've been doing. And uh, just to sum up, the goal here is to model these fine-grained um, single trial responses for each single sentence by accommodating that noise differs among experiments, participants, and brain regions without imposing that the same stimulus should have the same response for each repetition, which is not very natural in language research. Great, so moving on to the last point that I want to cover, uh, which is on the stimuli that are often being used in language experiments. Um, many traditional experiments um, that target a particular mental function use these hand-constructed and highly controlled stimuli. Um, although these are useful for testing specific hypotheses, these will not be a representative sample of linguistic input that you typically encounter in your everyday language use or reflect the richness and diversity of all available linguistic input. So, Let's try to cover a wide space as possible, and um, here I show some examples of sentences that are just being sampled from various uh, corpora. And these sentences have also been sampled to broadly span the meaning space using glove coherence vectors. So if you want your experiment to be independent of one particular topic or meaning, you can you know, broadly sample sentences to span all kinds of quarters of the meaning space, which is something that I did here. And then also by sampling from um, different corpora, we obtain these both syntactically and stylistically diverse sentences. And sampling from a broad space is arguably pretty good for model development and model building as we're interested in. However, um, it's a little bit tricky to figure out like how do we make this process more efficient? Um, how can we select these materials in a more efficient way? And besides just caring about how we obtain the best set of materials for model development, how do we also increase our chances of discovering something about how the brain processes language? And um, traditionally, how language neuroscience experiments have worked and how you select which materials you want to obtain uh, brain responses for has been uh, mainly motivated by top-down theorizing. Here, um, denoted by H, we have a hypothesis space. 
um, that we as experimenters can come up with. And then we come up with our linguistic stimuli, we record from our brain region of interest, here shown as the language network, um, and then we see whether our hypotheses were true or not. However, some of the distinctions that have been put forward using top-down theorizing and have been tested in these block designs that I talked about earlier have not always found empirical support. And in these cases, our human intuition and hypotheses did not reflect how the language network might be internally organized. So sometimes intuition is helpful, but there's also value in these more assumption-neutral approaches that I'm arguing for here. And I think this is where the ANNs come into uh, the picture. And um, now we can basically feed any given sentence to our, our ANN models for language and use these ANNs to derive stimuli. And you can use various approaches. One approach that I think we'll hear about in the talk right uh, after mine in a couple of minutes is to um, obtain these controversial stimuli, which are sentences that are optimally discriminate among different NN mo models. Um, however, we can also make use of the fact that these NNs are very predictive of brain responses during language processing. So we can also use this to derive the stimuli. And this is what I here denote as drive stimuli. Uh, and this is because the sentences are selected to drive certain brain regions. And by drive, I mean, for instance, elicit a stronger response in one brain region, here uh, noted as the anterior temporal lobe. So you can find these sentences that are predicted to yield a high response in a brain region of interest. In that manner, we can come up with a set of stimuli that we as humans did not expect or hypothesize um, that could be worthwhile to collect brain data for. And um, just to sum up, now we can basically exploit these ANNs to expand our hypothesis space about uh, what maximally would drive responses in certain language regions. And also for model building, we can explore a wide range of diverse sentences that we could not have come up with in advance ourselves. And I usually think of these stimuli as like tapping into the edges of the linguistic space. And a last note, um, I know that interpretability was also mentioned in the last uh, panel discussion. Uh, if we derive this like cool, diverse sentence set uh, by using NNs, we need some way of interpreting uh, these sentences. And um, here uh, we are developing a tool called SenseSpace, which basically allows you to quantify any sentence or any textual input using a set of um, features that have been hypothesized to be important in language processing. So you can check that out, it's online. And it was a conference paper last month. Um, so now I just want to summarize that the question that I focused on um, and structured my talk according to was why are most existing neuroscience data sets within language not ideal for model development? And I've been arguing that um, switching from group averaging, to group averaging to functional localization will allow us to specifically target language mechanisms in the brain. And the second point I was arguing for that we need to switch from block designs to these event-related single trial designs with a lot of unique um, sentences and stimuli, and in that way obtain neural responses for individual unique stimuli in, in a large way as possible. And the last point um, was that I was arguing that we can use ANNs to derive these uh, stimuli so we can decrease human bias and expand the hypothesis space. And um, by that, I think I will end this talk and we will switch to uh, another talk on this, somebody has a question, uh, and then we have a panel later as well. I have a question. Yeah. Gary Cottrell, UCSD. Um, so I read somewhere that an important part of language is words, and um, you're looking at the sentence level, and I, it seems like fMRI is kind of a slow technology for uh, word level things like, you know, if I say they all rose, you activate all the meanings of rose and 200 milliseconds <coughs> later, you've chosen the right meaning for the sentence. So there's very fine scale things that happen temporally. I wonder if you could comment on maybe the use of MEG or EEG for uh, this kind of work. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, that's exactly right. fMRI usually has a repetition time of uh, two seconds, 
which means that if you want to investigate how a particular lexical meaning of a word is extracted and being used, fMRI is probably not your tool of interest. Um, I would like to note that the language localizer that we use, um, the sentences versus non-words contrast, is targeting both word level and sentence level meaning because the non-words contrast does not engage the process of actually is extracting meaning of individu individual words. When you see a non-word, when you see a just like non-word that doesn't exist, you only access like the phonological forms of the words. You don't um, access the lexical uh, processing part. But yeah, um, so lexical processing is, in, is of course, um, important, but um, the localizer also gets at sentence level meaning, as you also mentioned, which is in combining these words into a phrase level and sentence level meaning. Um, I personally do not have any experience with uh, language neuroscience within EG and MEG yet, um, but um, we do have some, um, we have a postdoc, Corey Shane, in Ev's lab who's working on this, and we're hoping to yeah, look at more fine-grained differences. Yeah, thank you. Cool. Um, and the next speaker will be on Zoom, and uh, it will be Nico Kriegescourt from Columbia University. Uh, hopefully we'll come and uh, we'll be able to tell us a little bit about controversial stimuli and other important things. Great. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's all good. Thanks. Thanks, Greta. Great to be here. On, on GAC, um, such an important topic that we're all struggling with at the moment. So I think what we're thinking about is how to test brain computational theories by experiment, and in particular, uh, in the age of uh, big data and, and big models that we now have. So Big data and big models go well together, of course, because big data give us a lot of empirical constraints and big models have a lot of capacity and can therefore capture intelligent behavior and cognition and require a lot of empirical constraints. So that's kind of a marriage made in heaven, but it's also a totally different regime for cognitive computational neuroscience. For both cognitive neuroscience becoming more computational and computational neuroscience kind of growing up toward cognition. So one way that I think about this is in terms of different kinds of data. We have world data, brain data, and behavioral data. And it's important to keep in mind that these are very different in nature, and they're also uh, available to us in different amounts. So uh, I would, you know, sketch this uh, something like this, where we have, you know, abundant world data available via the internet. Um, we have abundant behavioral data also in the form of labels in the simplest case at the intersection to machine learning uh, also via the internet and then we have brain data that's also becoming bigger and bigger but still is the the most expensive source right and one way to think about this is that we need to somehow funnel these data into our high capacity models um, that's one important metaphor but it's also a somewhat limited way of thinking about it because Another important thing is to have multiple models and to do uh, model selection to adjudicate between these models as possible uh, explanations. And so because we have so much world data and behavioral data, at the moment, many of us, including my lab, are excited about using the world data and the behavioral data to uh, directly um, set the parameters in the models. And then we use the brain data uh, of which we have much less and which are much uh, more expensive to adjudicate among alternative models. But um, take that with a grain of salt. I think there are many other interesting games we can play here where we um, fit with a subset of the data and then try to use the inductive biases implicit to the model to predict um, the, the other type of data. And all of these would be forms of generalization challenge that might help us have insights about which of our models are uh, good models. So I think in this new reality of big data uh, and big models, we face lots of uh, problems. So I see a lot of problems and we think of them as exciting challenges, of course. We have to basically reinvent uh, the methodology for our field. And I think that's, that's really uh, refreshing and exciting and there are so many ideas around, like all of those that are discussed in this workshop. I want to talk uh, about three 
particular problems and then about a couple of solutions that we are, we're working on, um, which don't uh, begin to address all the problems, but you know maybe partially make some, some headway. The first problem is that we would like to derive theoretical insights from implemented models. So we have theories and we want to connect them to data, but theories are sort of high level verbally or mathematically defined, not implemented in computer simulations. And we need this intermediate level of models um, to test the theories. But there is a one to many relationship here where every theory could be implemented in multiple models. So this uh, creates an inference challenge if we want to derive theoretical insight uh, ultimately. And then there's another uh, one to many relationship between the models and the model instances when we train the same model from different random seeds or with different uh, random uh, sets of training data, we get a different model instance every time. So we also have to deal with this and we have to think about statistical methodology that takes this issue seriously. We have to uh, engage this problem in some way. Second problem is that we have to decide what abstractions to employ. So we're not interested in all of the biological details of the brain, but in some kind of abstract level. And often many of us have this level of the, the neural network architecture, the nodes and connections in the neural network in mind as kind of an abstract description at, at which provides a level of description at which we can uh, compare our computer simulation to uh, our brain measurements. But of course, that's not straightforward. The units in our models don't correspond one-to-one -to, -one to, to neurons, and uh, neurons in one person's brain don't correspond one-to-one -to, -one to neurons in another person's brain. So we need further abstraction to even uh, compare models to brains, and we have to think about the spatial scale we want to focus on there, the temporal scale, and the summary statistical uh, description that we choose. In neuroscience, there have been a number of popular abstractions uh, for uh, making the link between theories and data. One is cortical maps of tuning. You've heard Palanet uh, talk about how to bring that into um, the testing of, of neural network models. Uh, distributions of tuning functions, the representational geometry, uh, linear decoding analyses, and finally, single neuron selectivity, which for a long time was uh, so the major mode in electrophysiology to, to learn about brain function. Uh, we've argued that these levels can be organized into the onion of brain representations, where the outer, uh, the, the, the sort of totality of the onion is the spatially organized neur neuronal population code. And then we can strip off layers of the onion by leaving out more and more information that we think is less related to the computational function. For example, we can say we don't care about where exactly each neuron is in this population code. We just care about the population of tuning functions. Or we can say, well, we don't really care about the individual roles that neurons play. We care about the distinctions that this population of neurons emphasizes uh, jointly in the multivariate response space. We can go on. Uh, so th these, uh, under some assumptions, define uh, the total encoded information. And we can strip off more information and care only about particular linear neuronal readouts, where we disregard some of the information that's present in the code, because maybe we have a motivation to care about certain uh, variables that we think are ecologically especially relevant. And we can go on like this and uh, you know, end up at focusing on uh, information that's explicitly encoded in the response of, of single neurons. And all of these levels have a good motivation in some uh, scenarios, and I think it's, it's fun to think about them, to revisit all these uh, uh, levels that people have used in, in the history of neuroscience and consider in our uh, current uh, situation, what is the right level? And we probably need more than one, and we might also need abstractions that haven't been invented yet. The third problem is that we have to define when a model captures a computational mechanism. I think that neural network models can capture computational mechanisms, but many people agree with that. I would say to capture a brain computational mechanism, a model must be a cognitive model, so it must perform some cognitive task or component computation. 
that must be mappable in the sense that its variables must correspond to states of brain components at some level of abstraction. And then critically, it must be generalizable. It must predict far beyond the training distribution. And I want to say a little bit more about the levels of generalization that we care about there. There is the generalization to new response measurements for the same stimuli, and that's been very important in decoding studies. There is the generalization to new stimuli from the same distribution, and that became really well um, uh, accepted as a standard um, with, with encoding models. And then there's the generalization to a new distribution that the stimuli uh, are drawn from. And these have different implications. For example, in the context of visual representations, the first means that some information about the stimuli is really present. It's not just noise. The second means that the model instance really explains task performance and is not just overfitting sort of the, the set of experimental stimuli that we looked at. And the last means that the model architecture with its built-in inductive biases really matters for explaining task performance. And we care especially about this, this last one. And I think that's the direction that we want to move in. I want to briefly uh, share about two solutions we're working on. One is about experimental design. It's about test, testing models uh, out of distribution generalization performance. And the other is about data analysis, where it's about comparing models with inference methods that generalize to new subjects and conditions. So you can tell both of these are focused on this generalization challenge. In one case, the model generalizing to new stimuli. In the other case, our inferences generalizing across stimuli and subjects. So the experimental method was developed by Tal Golan, who's going to be on the panel. So uh, we're, we're going to get his take in a, in a moment as well. Uh, and it's, it's called controversial stimuli. Tal had the insight that training and testing on different sets of natural stimuli often does not reveal differences between models. So it just doesn't give us enough power to make the adjudication based on our data between models. So we need stronger tests of generalization performance. His first insight was that we can elicit the model's distinct inductive biases by testing out of distribution on a different distribution of stimuli. And these could be natural or synthetic stimuli. And his second insight was that since our goal is to adjudicate among models, we can create stimuli that are optimized to elicit distinct predictions from different models. And we call these controversial stimuli because they're controversial among different models. Uh, we did a, a, a vision study first, but I'm in the language uh, section. And even though we don't do language usually, TEL uh, started a collaboration with Christopher Baldassano's lab and Matt Siegelman in Chris's lab, uh, where they tested language models. And they included these very simple bigram and trigram models, as well as classical recurrent neural network models and modern transformer NN uh, models. So the idea here is that uh, these models attach probabilities to sentences. So we can think of the discrete probability space of sentences where a model like BERT will uh, attribute high probability to some sentences and low probability to some other sentences. And a different model like GPT-2 will have a different distribution attributing high probability to other sentences and low probability to, to other sentences. So there's a region in sentence space where the models agree that a sentence is either likely or unlikely. And there are these other re regions that we could call the controversial regions of sentence space. So what they did was they took a natural sentence that was eight words long and then uh, optimize that sentence uh, to go into these controversial regions of, of sentence space. And the way they did that was by iteratively changing words in the sentence. So they would pick a position among the eight positions and then consider replacing that word with each other word in the dictionary in such a way as to keep the probability according to one model, BERT in this case, at least the same while minimizing the probability according to the other model, in this case, GPT-2. And then, of course, it could also do the reverse and keep the probability the same according to GPT-2 and minimize it according to BERT. 
Here's some examples of such sentences. The natural sentence they started with in this case was, this is the lie you have been sold. And when they minimized the probability according to GPT-2, while keeping it the same according to BERT, they got, this is the week you have been dying. Um, grammatical sentence, but kind of a weird sentence because of its meaning. And when they minimized the probability according to BERT, but kept the probability the same according to GPT-2, they got, that is the narrative you have been sold. And that's a very natural sentence. So by using these kinds of stimuli, we can uh, compare these, these models. And here first, I'm gonna show you uh, what the model comparisons look like when we use just random natural sentences. What you see here is that all the models, including GPT-2, as well as these very naive bigram and trigram models, uh, perform similarly well and close to the noise ceiling, and they're not significantly different from each other. And we use, uh, in addition, uh, controversial sentences. Uh, we have much more power to discriminate between models. Here on the side, you see the, the significant differences where um, the solid circle uh, marks one model and the open circle marks all the other models that are dominated by this one model. So we get a lot of significant differences here, and we can also uh, see remaining shortcomings of GPT-2 in explaining the data in this task. So the second uh, thing I want to just take 30 seconds to draw attention to is uh, representational similarity analysis, which has been around for a while, uh, where we are currently uh, inviting all of you to uh, contribute to our open source uh, Python toolbox project, uh, which is all about taking the testing of computational models by predictions of representational geometries to the next level. And the idea is that we need to cross validate across both subjects and stimuli in order to uh, create these severe tests for our models, where the model is, is required to uh, you know, when it's fitted with one set of subjects and one set of stimuli to correctly predict brain representations in other subjects for other stimuli simultaneously. And around this cross-validation, this, this uh, double cross-validation, we wrap a two-factor uh, bootstrap procedure so as to treat both stimuli and subjects as random effects so that our model comparative inferences avoid overfitting to either the subjects or the stimuli, and also treat both subjects and stimuli as random effects. And we think that that enables us to really focus all this rich picture of inferential model comparative results that we get on the um, results that are really likely to hold up and to be of theoretical interest. So with this toolbox, you get outputs like this, where you can compare different different models and you have a noise ceiling and you get all the pairwise comparisons uh, nicely visually summarized. So in conclusion, uh, to provide mechanistic explanations, neural network models need to be cognitive, mappable, and generalizable. Experimentally, controversial stimuli provide severe tests of out-of-distribution generalization for different deep net models. And data analytically, we need model comparative inference that generalizes across experimental conditions as well as subjects. Thank you. Great, Probably thanks a lot, Nico. Yeah. Um, so what we'll do now is that we'll go to the last talk of this GAC by Alona Fish from University of Alberta. And then, um, Nico, you'll be part of the of the panel afterwards. And as well, we'll have uh, Tao, uh, who's here, right there, uh, join the panel as well. Um, so let's move on to the last talk. I can't share until you stop, Nico. Oh, oops. Thanks. Awesome, great. Uh, so thanks for having me. This has been such a fun uh, afternoon so far. I'm sad I couldn't be there uh, to enjoy the, the cool weather talk here where I am. Um, 
Um, finally, I got to reuse a lot of my slides uh, from a talk I gave in 2018 um, that was called uh, Big Data versus Big Theory. And so I was on the big data side. Uh, so here's my graphs and probably you're not surprised to hear that I was on the big data side given these graphs. Um, I think that uh, it's dangerous for us to hold too tightly to our theories. Um, and that's sort of the theme of the talk. But uh, in general, I think if anybody would say, uh, would you like more data or would you like more theory? I think people would say, I think both of there's value in both of those things. Um, and it's just really rather um, what order you would like them in and if you would allow one to bow to the other, which I will uh, elaborate on. So for a really simple example, uh, let's say we have a theory that coin flips are fair. And then we experience, we go ahead and collect some data and we find that this coin, uh, when flipped six times, turns up heads once and tails five times. These are Canadian coins from a Canadian speaker. Um, so from this, you might say, well, that data doesn't look very fair. Um, my uh, theory was that, that coins should be fair and this doesn't look great. So the reason we know this isn't great is if we calculate the maximum likelihood estimate based purely on the data, we would find that the probability of flipping a heads is 0.167, so a pretty low probability. And we can plot something that looks like this. So on the y-axis, we have the probability of the data given our parameter theta. And as we vary theta, we get a different uh, likelihood. If we want to maximize that likelihood, we would find the maximum at that 0.167 that we talked about. So I'm telling you this about this because what we can do is instead combine our data with our knowledge or intuition. So we have some sort of theory that the coins should be fair that coins in general are fair and give us some random coin from my wallet, you would find that, that the coin flips are fair. So we have a prior belief that the data likelihood should be maximized at 0.5. But we have the data itself and we found that there is a different maximum to the data that we observed. And so we would like to be able to combine those together to get some sort of mixture of the two. And in cases where we don't have very much data, when we combine the two, uh, we would get um, some small shift in our uh, the, the parameter that, like, that maximizes the data. So here we would get, uh, if we consider both the data and our prior beliefs, we would get that the maximal, the data that maximizes the likelihood is 0.42. So then we could go out and collect some more data. Let's go collect some more data. Let's go do 600 coin flips. And again, we get the same thing. Oh, geez, 100 heads and 500 tails. So now instead our distribution looks something like this. We have the probability of our data um, very, very peak at 0.167. So we have very strong belief given our data that our prior belief is actually wrong. And so when we combine the two together, we would get something that looks like this. Um, the, our prior belief would bow to our data and we would get something that looks a lot more like the data we collected rather than our theory that we went in with. And so I tell you this because I think that um, Theories are important and they help us decide where to point our data machines. Uh, but we also need to recognize that we are all humans and our, as humans we are, um, we can sometimes cling too tightly to our theories. And so we need to be flexible like a maximum all posteriori estimate and allow our uh, ideas to change as data comes in. So as we collect more data that may or may not be in conflict with the things that we thought were true, we need to be able to, to recognize that and, and uh, let go of our uh, theories. So it's a bit of a false dichotomy. We need theories, yes, but we need theories that are flexible enough to bow up the data. And that's the idea, of course, that the falsifiable model is one that um, we can see if it's wrong based on our experiments. And we also need people who can um, see when they were wrong and change your mind. I'm not always good at that, but now I'm going to regale you with a few times where I thought I was so smart and was not so smart. So for a little bit of fun at the end of the afternoon. And this actually uh, uh, plays into the previous talk from Greta um, about averaging across participants. So uh, I also used to think that brains were uh, idiosyncratic and um, 
everybody's brain was special and that we should never average data across people. So if my student, Chris Foster, had asked me before he did it, if it was a good idea to average in sensor space EEG data across participants, I would have told him no. But luckily for us both, he did not ask me, and he just did it. And it turns out that it actually works pretty well, especially in regimes where you don't have very many repetitions per stimuli. So when you don't have very many repetitions per stimuli, you have very noisy samples. And so actually averaging across participants who have seen the same stimuli, at least for EEG, did give us the power we needed to be able to do the prediction task in this particular paper. And I think that's partially because EEG data is very spatially smooth. So EEG data doesn't actually pick up a lot of those idiosyncratic things about how people's brain localizations of the language areas are slightly different. Uh, a lot of that is smoothed away, and so averaging across people uh, in EEG sensor space is actually fine. And it's been fine for this paper as well as subsequent ones that I've done. Uh, so this is a case where I would have said, don't, uh, my theory is that brains are too different and we shouldn't be averaging EEG data, and I would have, and I was proven wrong. So now we do it sometimes. And then here's a, a little bit longer of an example where I thought I was so smart and I was not. Um, so we heard previously about LSTMs very briefly and also about pseudo words. Uh, so this is an example where we actually used LSTMs to try to create representations for pseudo word sentences. Um, and my student Miriam and I thought up this uh, experiment and it was based on data we actually got from uh, Greta and uh, Andrea Martin, uh, who are at Max Planck, um, which is in collaboration with them. Uh, here, uh, the question was, um, will these representations that come out of RNNs for atypical language look different uh, and not match the brain response? So to give you an, just a quick overview, you probably know recurrent neural networks. They create representations for each uh, observation in a sequence. Here the observations um, are words. And what we're going to do is essentially take these representations out of our recurrent neural network. Uh, and, and see how related they are to brain responses to the same sequence of words. So when the sequences of words are well formed, um, this relationship is strong. There's a relationship between the brain's response to a sequence of words and the RNN's representation for that same sequence of words. So our question here was, what if the um, language we show, both the person and the RNN, is not well formed? So what if the language is a little bit kooky and it's not what you expect? And in particular, it's not what the RNN saw during training. So in this case, um, we had data from Andrea Martin's lab with three conditions. One was a sentence condition where people just read regular sentences, tall men build houses and the sweet dogs bring boards. There was also matched jabberwocky sentences where each of the words except for and the had been transformed into pseudo words. So raw men build booms and the sweet dogs print boats. It has the feeling of being Englishy, but it's not English. So it has <clears throat> the feeling of uh, syntax while ablating semantics. And then we had a wordless condition where the words of the sentence were shuffled. Uh, and so we, here we have word level semantics, but we've ablated uh, syntax as well as compositional semantics. So what we're going to do is take a decoding model. Each of these three conditions uh, will play, were played for uh, a person. They collected brain imaging data, EEG data, and the same text was shown to a pre-trained recurrent neural network. This re the recurrent neural network, I'm not going to get into it, but it could uh, sort of create representations even for pseudo words, even though it hadn't observed pseudo words during uh, the same pseudo words during training. So we'll extract the representations from the RNN, and then we train the model to predict that RNN representation, essentially to find the relationship between the brain response to that sequence of words or pseudo words and the RNN's response to the same sequence. And then we'll ask, is there a prediction from that model like the true representation for a held out uh, sample from the RNN? So here's where we get down to, I thought I was so smart and was not. Um, so here we have the three uh, conditions, sentences, jabberwocky, and wordless. And remember, the recurrent neural network we're going to use for this was not trained on pseudo words. It never saw any pseudo words during training. So my personal um, hypothesis was I was expecting this paper to go like this. You, you think RNNs are so like the brain. Here's an example where they're not like the brain. So I thought it was going to look like this. I was thinking sentences, yes, we would get the same relationship to RNNs that we had seen previously. Jabberwocky, no, no relationship. 
and wordless, no, no relationships because RNNs are not trained on jabberwocking, they're not trained on word lists. Uh, and so here's what we got on the y axis here you can think of as accuracy, how, how related are those two as the representation of the brain and the representation from the LSTM. And on the long x axis here are like the layers of the RNN. I'm not going to go into too much detail with that. But what we found was uh, here are the points where stars are significantly above chance. And we found, like we thought, uh, I was correct for the sentences. We found above chance accuracy and then did not see it for the word list. But what was surprising here was that for the Jabberwocky, we actually did see above chance decodability, meaning that these LSTM models, though they had never seen pseudowords, were able to create representations that look enough like the brain imaging data for people listening to the same pseudoword sentences that they, we were able to distinguish uh, one sentence from another. So here's my predictions, and I was correct on two counts and incorrect in the middle. And Maryam Hashem Sade, who was the lead student on this, uh, spent a lot of time convincing me that this is true. Um, and it was in an instance where my the paper I thought we were going to write was not the paper we ended up writing, which is fun and interesting and it's exactly the sort of thing, if I might, you know, sort of toot my own horn, it's exactly the sort of thing we should be doing. We have a model. We think it's going to go one way and the data tells us something else. So theory versus data, it's a false dichotomy. We don't need just one or the other. We can have both. But we need to be able to be flexible enough to see when our theories are wrong, um, and set up our experiments so that we can be wrong and move uh, beyond and above after that. And so the, the first time I gave this talk, I was alongside Eve Martyr, and uh, in response to what I had just said, she told me of a scenario where she had a student come to her and tell her this amazing theory of what neurons were doing and blah, 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 and, and Eve Martyr said to the student, well, go ask the crabs, meaning go and find your data, go and test your hypotheses, let's see if you're right. So go ask the crabs, is your theory um, does your theory agree with your data? And so I, the title of this talk was Kill Your Darlings, and that's because there's a creative writing uh, sort of saying that you should throw away your favorite sentences uh, and start over sometimes because those favorite sentences that you have are holding you back. And so I think it's the same thing in science. You have your favorite theories, and you need to recognize when you're holding too tight to them. What would it mean if you, if you thought your theories were wrong what, how would the world be different? Can you have that mental arithmetic inside to see if, what the world would look like if your theories were incorrect? So let your data kill your drivers. Thanks. Cool. Thanks a lot. Um, I've been told that the organizers would like to, um, there's going to be a break, and I think there is coffee outside. Um, so I think we'll have to cut panel two, but all the speakers will be up here in front and we are happy to take um, any questions and also communicate virtually after uh, the session. Yeah, also there is probably snacks outside yeah. as well. So <laughs> this is the right time to take a break before the next yeah. session. So, but yeah, but uh, the, the speakers are here uh, and uh, please come up to ask questions and interact more. And hopefully we can continue the interaction in some other form. Yeah, uh, so thanks so much for everyone uh, speaking today and for the organizers and for all of you uh, for listening and participating. Thank you very much. I think this was a very exciting first GAC. Uh, we're now going into the break till 4.35 p.m. So we're just starting five minutes delay, so you have proper time to get coffee and uh, get a snack. <laughs>